What's up, Ada Nation? Welcome to Dapp Central, your home for everything blockchain and crypto. I'm your host here, Fareed. MinSwap community, your time to shine is officially here. As a part of today's video, I want to dive into a recent article that was just released about the highly anticipated version two of the MinSwap protocol. MinSwap definitely needs no introduction here. One of the largest, if not the largest DEX here in terms of user adoption and TVL in the growing Cardano ecosystem. We saw the recent release or news about the announcement of V2 taking place right after the Cardano summit in Dubai, which was about six or seven months ago. The team has been building very diligently here. They've gotten two audits and we now have an official timeline for when we can expect for V2 to come online. So as a part of today's video, I wanna dive into the latest article released by the team, breaking everything down that you need to know. As always, if you guys do enjoy updates like these, I would appreciate you if you could smash that thumbs up. If it's your first time stopping by and you want more, consider subscribing. And last but not least, if you have any questions, make sure to go ahead and leave those down below. Now, I'll leave the link to the official article down below if you guys want to go ahead and read it for yourself. It's about a 15 to 20 minute read. Of course, I'm going to go ahead and quickly break down some of the biggest takeaways here, which include the launch timelines, the bug bounty program, security and audits. And then I want to touch on all of the new features there's a laundry list of brand new capabilities coming with the new version of this DEX. So it states here today we're giving an update on the state of the MinSwap V2 launch. Kicking things off here with the timeline first, we have the beta testnet, which will be kicking off on June 3rd, ending on June 20th, which lasts about 17 days. We also have the bug bounty program. So for anybody who's technically gifted that wants to try and poke holes in the MinSwap V2 protocol or their smart contracts, you will be rewarded by actually turning in some of the bugs that you find, and that'll kick off on June 1st, and that'll end on June 30th. Following that, we have the public testnet. So keep in mind, the beta testnet will be closed. That'll only be available for some of the more passionate early adopters of the MinSwap community. Now, for the public testnet, that'll kick off on June 14th, where anybody right, can basically go ahead, jump in and test out the platform. After that, we have the highly anticipated mainnet launch. So they don't have an actual date listed here. However, that'll come shortly after the conclusion and the fixes of any potential bugs that are found during the public testnet and the bug bounty program. So hopefully that gives you guys a little bit of a heads up. It seems to me, for example, early July-ish would be a great time, if not mid-July, for when we actually see this protocol coming on a line. Next, we have some of the biggest changes or the new features rolling out for V2. So this is where things begin to get interesting. It states here the overarching theme of this narrative is the new iteration of dApps that are much faster, composable, decentralized, versatile, and cheaper than the previous or the initial versions of Cardano DeFi apps. I mentioned this before, a lot of projects are now going into the V2 stage. Kicking things off, obviously, MinSwap V2 is going to be coming right down the corner. There's also Indigo V2, which just released on the mainnet. That took about six to eight months to sort of tie together, clean up, get audited, and have the actual community vote to deploy that, right? So a lot of teams upgrading. We also even have the Sunday Swap team releasing V3. We also have the Wing Riders team also making pretty big updates when it comes to their decks as well. So I think this is going to be sort of the narrative moving forward. We've had a lot of dApps deploying initially with the first and second versions of Plutus, and we're now starting to see them beginning to take advantage of those benefits in terms of efficiency, scalability, and decentralization. And of course, as Plutus V3 comes online, there's going to be even more updates coming down the pipes. Jumping back in here, the first sort of new feature is going to be what they call auto routing. So typically, when you make a swap, it's usually done within a single pool. So for example, let's say you're swapping ADA to MIN and there's only the ADA to MIN pool. That's exactly the route that will be taken or the pool that will be used. In other instances, there may be multiple pools for a single asset. So for example, an ADA slash MIN pool, but then there could also be a IUSD slash MIN pool there as well. Now, depending on the depth of the liquidity, it might make more sense if you want to swap your ADA for MIN to actually also incorporate a swap from IUSD into MIN, depending again on the liquidity and the price impact. So it states here that this is essentially like having an aggregator within MinSwap itself, 
where if there are multiple pools with the asset that you're looking to swap in or out of available, that the protocol will automatically fig figure out the best route in order to give you the best value. Scrolling down, we have the advanced order types, which include limit orders, basically stating the price of the swap that you want has to be met in order for the trade to go through. For example, if you're making a purchase, you'll set a limit at which you want to purchase tokens for in terms of the maximum value per token. And as long as the price is below that, the order will execute and then vice versa. If you want to sell, you can set a limit where you want to sell your tokens for value at, but then anything lower than that will not get triggered. Of course, again, making sure to not sell your tokens for less than what you think that they should be worth. So right below that, they do also talk about the fact that with limit orders, they'll be presenting what they call partial fills. So you'll have a fully fill or a partial fill, depending on the size of your order. We've seen the Genius Seal team also implementing partial fills, which I think is just going to be the norm moving forward. There's also what they call the stop order, which basically enables traders to prevent a negative price swing. So for example, you can think of this as a stop loss where you set an order and if the price of whatever token it is that you set an order for goes below a certain amount, your tokens will be automatically sold in the event that the token value continues to decrease. So this reduces your risk in case there is a black swan event or sharp downturn in the value of your asset. There's also a new feature called OCO or one cancels the other, where you can basically combine the stop order with a limit order. And depending on which one is hit first, if the price swings downwards, your assets will be sold off. But if the price continues to stay within that range or appreciates, you may actually get a buy or trigger on your limit order. Now, depending on which one hits first, the, op the opposite or the other will automatically be canceled. There's also the zap in feature, which allows for you to quickly provide liquidity. There's also the zap out feature, which allows for you to provide liquidity or pull out liquidity, I should say, in exchange for one single asset as opposed to two token pairs. It makes it easier to deposit and withdraw liquidity if you're only dealing or only want to deal with one single asset pair or one single token, I should say, out of the asset pair in that liquidity pool. There's also a donation order, which will allow for a bit of liquidity to be sent to a recipient's address directly from the liquidity pool. So it states here that this allows users to donate assets to a specified recipient or cause directly from the from the liquidity pool. This order type enables the support of community projects, charities, or other initiatives without requiring a direct transfer from one user's wallet to another. This will basically be a transaction coming from a liquidity pool. So pretty cool to see there as well. There's also a deposit with flexible amount or a withdrawal with a flexible amount. And what this will basically do is allow for the um, user to deposit an amount, but then that will be sort of zapped in or out of a liquidity pool. So there's some examples here again, for the sake of time, I can't break them all down, but it's good to see that the team is thinking about all of these quality of life features to make it easier to deposit or withdraw funds as you see fit. Next, we've got advanced order types. There's also a fill or kill order type where it states orders can now be refunded automatically by the batcher if the price is out of slippage range so that users don't have to manually cancel their order. This was an issue that I definitely noticed and faced when the MinSwap protocol, excuse me, the Sunday Swap protocol went live. That was one of the first AMM protocols to go live in January of 2022 where you would place an order, but because of the slippage, your order would be out of range and basically it would just sit there indefinitely until either the price of the asset came down or until you manually canceled it. In this event now, with the filler kill, that cancellation will take place automatically, simplifying and saving you a little bit of time. There's also a brand new order expiration feature, which will allow for orders to have a specific time in which they become expired. So if you're maybe looking to get an order in or an order filled um, before a certain deadline, this will be the feature that you want to go ahead and use. Next, we've got a brief piece here surrounding the trading fees on the platform. So in V1, they had a flat 0 0.03 trading fee applied to all liquidity pools. That will no longer be the case. But moving forward, each liquidity pool have the ability to have its own fee structure or its own trading fees. So 
At pool creation, there's going to be a standard liquidity pool fee, and that can range anywhere between half of a percent all the way to 20%. And in order to make sure that liquidity isn't fragmented or broken up amongst numerous pools on the protocol, there's only going to be allowed one liquidity pool per asset pair when possible. Number two, you'll be able to adjust the fees after pool creation. And so again, that'll range between half a percent to 20%. But keep in mind, there will be a vote that has to be done using the governance dashboard in order for those liquidity pool fees to be updated. In addition, there will be buy and sell fees. And so those can actually differ from one another. So if you want to maybe make it a little bit of a higher fee for anybody who's buying in versus somebody who's selling, you can also go ahead and manage that. They do briefly talk about dynamic fees where these will basically act like how they do in TradFi or what is known as spreads in TradFi in the blockchain or decentralized Web3 space. Scrolling down, we've got protocol fees. So these, these are fees that go back directly to MinSwap. And so we saw back in the day with V1, a redirect of half a percent of the 0.3% swap fee that was uh, put on every single swap that took place on the platform. Now, moving forward, the team can, again, adjust this particular fee, which basically goes back over to MinSwap token stakers. Now it states here, and this is really interesting, while building V2, MinSwap Labs was approached by several teams about a feature to direct some of the fees directly back over to the projects whose liquidity is being held on MinSwap. So as an example, think of Indigo. What they like to do is provide liquidity to different DEXs. And in this particular instance, imagine some of the fees generated from the ADA slash IUSD liquidity pool actually going directly back over into the Indigo team's hands. Now, this is a huge benefit here. It obviously incentivizes the Indigo team to provide even more liquidity, making the trading experience on MinSwap for their assets that much easier and that much more frictionless for end users as well. So it's a win-win in that particular regard. And the team is trying to figure out exactly how to manage this. But again, they're gonna be rolling out what they call a structured partner program with a series of requirements such as a DAO structure and a minimum TVL and volume. So not every project will be able to take advantage of this, but the ones that do will definitely have an edge and I think have uh, a better long-term success when it comes to trading volume and activity on the MinSwap DEX. Now, as we get ready to wind things down here, they do break down some updates surrounding the V2 throughput. So it states here that with the V1 contracts that a max throughput of eight swaps per batch. Now, given how they process orders, which is using a fair first in and first out manner, the average maximum throughput that they really saw, right, was actually three swaps per batch. Now that's gonna be a huge improvement in V2 of about 10X. So it states you that with V2, they've now tested the maximum amount of throughput for each of the contracts to be at 36 swaps per batch. So it's a whopping 10 time or 10X improvement compared to V1. In terms of sustainability, they've talked about how with V2, they plan on saving an average of nine kilobytes per transaction, which comes out to about 28 gigabytes of node storage per year. So again, efficiency, scalability, and just throughput have all really been improved here with V2. Now it also breaks down a second angle of sustainability, which is related to batcher fees. Right now with V1, there is a minimum amount of two ADA per batch. We've seen the splash protocol reduce that significantly to I think a little bit around a half of an ADA, but we're gonna see a very similar reduction here with V2 of MidSwap as well, but they haven't given us any hard numbers yet. So it states here, this opens up room to significantly reduce batcher fees with MidSwap V2. And then last but not least here, they do break down the composability benefits of this brand new platform. So there's basically more flexibility in terms of who can interact with liquidity pools and exactly um, what actions can be done either before or after a transaction has been executed. So some of them include the fact that you can now pass tokens and NFTs in an order to the output. You can also go ahead and have an, an order expire and return back to the original script. You can have an order be returned back to the sender. You can have a script to quote unquote donate assets to a pool. For example, like a DAO can yield rewards back over into liquidity pools. So again, this does get pretty technical here, but a lot, a lot of brand new features. 
a lot of flexibility for anybody who is deep within the DEX and liquidity pool or liquidity providing space. Last but not least, they talk a little bit about extendability. And then they also talk a little bit about security, where I do want to go ahead and close out today's video, highlighting the fact that MinSwap V2 has had two audits, right? So they've worked with Certic and they've also worked with Anastasia Labs. And in the coming weeks, they're going to be publishing or releasing their bug bounty program for V2, where we've seen upwards of twenty to $30,000 going out to anybody who's able to pinpoint, find a bug and report it back over to the MinSwap team. So that will do it there. Again, pretty technical video here. Wanted to take the opportunity to break this down. It was just released not too long ago. Hopefully you guys found this to be helpful, but I'm definitely looking forward to seeing what the MinSwap team is able to do with this brand new iteration. Keep in mind, they also have their own Min wallet, which will be coming back sort of to life with the release of V2. Um, a lot of people just aren't even aware that the fact of the fact, excuse me, that this team has their own wallet, but they're going to be making sure to bring that back to the spotlight with more features, integrations, and possibilities with V2. That will do it here for today's video, breaking down all of the highly anticipated features for MinSwap V2. As always, if you guys enjoyed today's video or learned anything or just found this to be helpful, I would appreciate you if you could smash that thumbs up. If it's your first time stopping by and you want more content like this breaking down all of the biggest builders in Cardano, consider subscribing. And last but not least, if you have any questions or just want to leave your opinion down below about MinSwap V2, then go ahead and use that comment section down below. That said, and as always, I'll see you guys in the next video.